It's an honor to be here with you. I've been here several times at, and uh, was able to minister a little bit at the missions conferences over the last couple of years. But this is the first time to really be with you on a Sunday or, you know, just minister the word of God. Amen. And so uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm excited to be able to minister the word to you. And uh, I just want to thank the Harbombs. You know, we met, uh, I, I say we, my, my father and I, uh, <clears throat> were at the uh, 2009 uh, missions conference at, I don't know, maybe if you've heard of them or not, but Pastor David Shipman, <laughs> ring a bell, anybody? Okay, yeah, I, did, I, I thought he might be somebody you might recognize. Amen. And at that time, I was serving with my dad, and uh, he told me, hey, I'm going to be speaking at a missions conference up in Visalia with David Shipman, and I thought, no reason for me to stay here. I'll, I'll go with you. And so uh, that was a wonderful uh, meeting. But it was not only just a wonderful meeting, but I met Pastor Kenneth Harbaum for the very first time. And him and my dad had known each other a little bit, but not really had a, kicked off the relationship like it did from then on. Amen. And so honestly, you know, we've been saying this back and forth, but I mean it 100%. I consider the Harbaum's family. Yes. And so uh, I hope they consider the same about us, but we love you guys very, very much. You have no idea. You really just don't. You just, I don't know if you get it. <laughs> that's, no, that's no insult to your intelligence. <laughs> you just don't understand the depth uh, of how much we love you. Honestly, there are few people on planet Earth sometimes that you, can, you feel like you can go to that give a rip. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Are you all just perfect? Raise your hand if you're perfect. That way we can all get your number. Scott, you're perfect. I had a feeling. <laughs> we all knew you were perfect. Yes. Every, we all need to sit by Scott a little bit more and get that anointing. Amen. <clears throat> but the Harbombs have truly been real, genuine friends to the Gatlin family. You know, my mom and my dad both say hello. And uh, they love you very much. I know you know my dad more than you know me. And, uh, but the Gatlins love the Harbombs. We love Covenant of Peace. And we're excited about the, what, what the Lord's doing through you here locally and all around the world. Yes. Don't tell me that you have to be in some big city somewhere with right. thousands upon thousands of people in your, in your ministry to reach the world. You guys are doing it. I said you guys are doing it. Amen. <laughs> And you're doing it in style, too. You're not just, oh, we're kind of hanging in there. No, you're kicking the devil right in the teeth. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You, he's, he needs a dental appointment every time you guys wake up in the morning. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's the truth. And I do want to say this. I'm not trying to butter you up before I start speaking, but, <laughs> but this is all the truth. You know, it's not very, I have six kids. <clears throat> I am the oldest of three. And uh, my younger brother is in uh, Texas. He just pioneered a church probably a month and a half ago at this point. And he has five kids. We get confused back and forth a lot. People, not, we're not confused about who we are. Other people <laughs> confuse the two of us for some reason because we both, we both have lots of kids. We weren't going for a TV show and we weren't really that competitive, but it seems like it. You know, so... Anyway, he's in Texas, and my youngest brother uh, serves with my dad in California. Amen. And, uh, and so we all just love you people, that's for sure, every one of us. And uh, when I was here at the um, October conference, the missions conference, it's hard when you go anywhere, when you have this many kids. How many of you have a good handful of kids? So you're all shy. What are you talking about? Let's be honest, if you have two or three kids, that's still a good amount of work. But I have, right? Can I get a better amen than that? How many of you have ever had? Yeah. We got revival broke out right here on the second. <laughs> Someone get slain, ushers? <laughs> He's on his own. <laughs> he is an usher. Oh, that's gold. Oh, man. Anywhere you go when you have eight people in your family. You go to a restaurant, you go to anywhere. Hotels are always fun, <laughs> you know, so especially being our neighbor in the hotel is always fun. <laughs> what is, is that a zoo? Did they bring a zoo? I think I heard farm animal noises. 
Yeah, that's always fun. But I'll tell you something about you. Your ministry of helps here has made it so easy to come and go and be a part of this church. This is our home away from home. Amen. And so we're gr- deeply grateful for how well you've received us and made it accommodating so that even a large crew, we're not the Partridge family, but we're starting to wonder, you know, we've, we've, we've got a large crew and a big bus and everything. <laughs> We don't have the painting on the sides. We don't sing songs as we travel, but, but we're starting to look clean that direction, I think. But I really appreciate you guys and your ministry of helps. Uh, you ought to give yourselves a hand for being such a wonderful church. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I want to uh, do a verse by verse of the book of Leviticus. If we're, you guys okay? Are you okay with that? I'm just joking. If you'll open your Bible to 2 Corinthians, I won't do that to you. Especially not on the first time here, you know what I mean? (laughs) Got a message that the Lord kept, I don't want to say bugging because it sounds like I'm not okay with it. He can do whatever he wants. But I was trying to go a different direction. I felt like, you know, here's what we need to do, Lord. You ever try to coach the Lord? Do we need an altar call for liars in here? (laughs) You ever try to coach the Lord on what really ought to ought ought to take place? Well, he kept nudging me. Well, no, 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 no. You need to deal with this. So tonight we're going to deal with some stuff that I believe everybody has to combat in their own life. Everybody. Now we're going into the holiday season. We just had Thanksgiving shortly around the bend here. We're going to have Christmas. And you know what that means. Family. Now, that word right there drums up a variety of emotions for some of us. Some of us were thinking, yes. Some of us are thinking, God, no. <laughs> and so, you know, you got you to gotta deal with that. And, and those responses come for a variety of reasons. Amen. So we're going to get into some things tonight that I think, honestly, I'm going to be preaching to myself just as much as I will be you. Because it's what we're talking about tonight isn't just family related. It's anybody, any humans, anybody here besides me ever deal with humans? How many are one? Okay. That's what I thought. Second Corinthians chapter four. It's a boring church. Wow. (laughs) You go to some places, they look at you like, what's a Bible? You guys are excited about it. That's what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Let me know when you're there. Grunt, say amen, hallelujah, something. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel. Sorry, I skipped here. Light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. The God of this world. Now, who's the God of this world? I want to establish that right now because we're going to get into a few things that uh, I don't want anybody to be confused. Now, I get this. You guys are a well-taught church, but can you humor me a little bit tonight and act like this is the first time you've heard any of this? Do me a favor. (laughs) Help me out here. And I'm also smart enough to know that this is being live streamed. And so this can get access through from people all over the world at any time from now and into the future. So I don't want to just skip through stuff that we all feel is basic. I want to make sure that we're laying some ground rules here. Amen? So who's the God of the world? Now, he's not the God of you and me. But he's doing his very best, and unfortunately, he's succeeding at blinding people. Anybody ever known anybody that was blind? I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about it's like the answer is right in front of their face, but they still can't see it. No matter what you do, no matter how much sense you try to talk into them, they don't get it. They're blind to it. <clears throat> you know, when you're trying to win people to Jesus, you know, you, you can't. Sometimes you want to get mad because it's like, how do you not understand this? Oh, well, the reason is because you've already been enlightened. You see it. It's been revealed. If I put a cloth over this pulpit and I try to tell you about this pulpit and describe it, well, okay, okay, you, I'm, you're using, I hear what you're saying, but it hasn't become real to me. I haven't seen it. 
You've tried to describe it to the best of your ability, but I haven't touched it. I haven't felt it. I haven't done any of that. I haven't experienced any of it. But as soon as I begin to pull the cover off, and now it's revealed to you all of a sudden, oh, that's what you meant by that. See, you did your best, but until it's revealed to you, it means nothing. Amen. And so the God of this world is doing his very best to blind the people who have not yet received Jesus Christ. And so when we go out and we witness to people, sometimes you want to thump them in the forehead because how do you not see this? Well, do you ever go up to a physically blind person and ask them, how many, how many fingers am I holding up? And get ticked off because they don't see it. Why? Because you know. They cannot see. So that's why it's important that we pray. And the Bible talks about praying that the blinders will be removed. The blinders will be removed. Amen. That was just a side note. I'm not even going to charge you for it. It's not part of my message. But let's go to Psalm 91. Amen. Psalm 91. It's an obscure chapter in the Bible, but we're going to deal with it today. Amen. Psalm 91. Going to look at verse 13. Psalm 91, verse 13. <clears throat> Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Okay, now let's go to Luke. Hang in there with me. Don't get off the ride until it comes to a complete stop. <laughs> Luke chapter 17. Verse 19. I'm sorry, what am I talking about? Luke 10. What? I'm ahead. Luke 10. Wait for the preacher to know what he's doing. Luke chapter 10. Better read this right. Verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. <clears throat> Everybody shout, behold. behold. Was that a shout? Was that like your Sunday night shout? Or you do better on Sundays or? Give me a shout. Shout, behold. Behold. Man, that's what I'm talking about. I knew you had it in you. Behold. What does that mean? Look. You know, they used to, maybe they still do. They had the furniture spray. Yeah, behold. And they, remember, and they had the commercial that you know, with the little girl that just cleaned the coffee table. And she... All of a sudden, you know, they get the camera just right, and behold, you can see yourself in it. Right? Behold. So every time, you know, every time you see the word behold, that's what I think of. Look, or I need you to see yourself in this verse. See yourself in this verse. Or you could put it this way. See what this verse is talking about. Begin to operate in your life. Do what it takes to apply this into your life until you see it happening. You can behold it. It's happening. You've heard the, the term behold, the, the beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Amen. Everybody doesn't have the same flavor, but you see it. It means something to you. Amen. Behold, everybody shout it one more time. Behold, I give you, give unto you power, or that word would be better translated authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, we were just reading about you, you tread on the lions and the adders. That was Old Testament. Now, we're also still reading about the fact that God, did, by the way, is this, what color ink is this in your Bible? I have a Bible that's two-toned, so it's got black ink, it's got red ink. Red means Jesus is speaking. As far as I know, Jesus is a top authority on Christianity. If he's not in your life, get to the altar. <laughs> Jesus is a top authority on Christianity, don't you think? So he is the one who's speaking, and he's telling you. You need to see yourself with the authority that I died for you to have. So nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Say it. 
nothing, nothing. say it again, nothing, nothing. shall by any means, by any means. Hurt, me. hurt me. Amen. I guarantee you that's something Pastor Harbaugh is speaking over himself as he's going overseas. You would be a ding to travel around the world and not have some of these types of verses confessing these over your life. Can I be really bold? Don't be a ding congregation and not confess them over yourself and over your pastor when he does travel because he's representing you. Amen. And he's representing Jesus. Are we not in covenant? Amen. This is covenant of peace. What does peace mean? Nothing missing and nothing broken. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Praise God. Now, go to Luke 17. Here we go. Here we're, getting to this, here we're getting to the stuff that the Lord dealt with me on. Luke chapter 17. Anybody ever heard this phrase? Sticks and stones. Very good. Let's, let's, let's see if we can do it in unison. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Sticks and stones break my bones, but words will What do you think? Is that true or not? Probably not. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. Like most of the things they teach you in school, but I won't go there. Oh, I just did. Luke 17, verse 1. We're going to talk about beating bitterness. Beating bitterness. The, you know, we just read about authority. And you've heard plenty of, you know, messages on authority. Some, some of them were swang, you know, chandelier swingers. Some of them were aisle runners. Some of them were just rehash and let's go over it again. Repetition. Amen. But I want to bring this to your attention in the realm of bitterness and unforgiveness. If you are not careful, you are going to have a very hard time using your faith because bitterness will jack it all up. Amen. It's true. Let's read this. Even Jesus began to... I'm going to read Jesus' words again. Okay? This is Luke 17. We're going to look at verse 1. Then he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Stop. It's, it's, you cannot live through life without having some offense of some sort come. Your direction. Raise your hand. If you've ever had an opportunity to get offended. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. If you've been lo- alive longer than five minutes, you've had an opportunity to get offended. Am I right? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I thought so. Sure. I mean, all you got to do is go Christmas shopping. <laughs> Anybody else gone Christmas shopping and had some... Rude little elf, rip something off the shelf before you got to it or whatever. I remember my dad told me a story. I, I could not believe it. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Do you already know this story? Okay. I'm, he's at the mall, and he's looking. He, he literally picks up this sweater that's the exact size. And I can't remember, remember if it's for him or my mom, but he's not a sweater guy. i got to assume it was for my mom. So he's got this sweater that he just pulled off the shelf. The only one left in its size. It just happened to be my mom's size. And he's looking at it, just trying to decide whether this is something he wants to get. And all of a sudden, in that aisle, some lady grabs the sweater out of his hand and walks away. I mean, it wasn't even on the shelf. Just jacked it out of his hands and walked away. Well, you know, I can forgive somebody after I... Rig their cart or something, you know, to, to crash. You know, you know, you sure. But you know, those are small, uh, small things. Anybody do traffic? See, originally I'm from LA. Don't tell me about traffic. I know traffic. There's about 122 ways to get offended in traffic. You know, somebody gives you the Hawaiian good luck sign, <laughs> or they cut you off, or you know, any number of things that they can do, right? And so. There's always a reason to get offended. 
If you're at the store, you have a reason to get offended. If you're at church, don't look around. Don't look around. Don't look around. Ma'am, you're looking. Notice I looked over <laughs> multiple ways just so I get that joke up. Yeah, there, if you're at church, you have a reason to be offended. Why? Because people are everywhere. And humans have a tendency to do things on purpose and not on purpose. No intentions whatsoever of ticking you off, but it just happened to press your button that day. Amen. It's impossible that offenses will come. They're going to happen. So what do we do? We have to decide how are we going to handle these things. I want to quickly, because I'm I'm running out of time, uh, I want to quickly deal with a couple things that Jesus said about offense. And I don't know if you've studied this out or not, but if, if you have, please just act like you've never heard this before. And if you haven't, take notes because it's going to help you. Amen. Go to verse 6. Luke 17, verse 6. And the Lord said, if he had a grain, faith is a grain of mustard seed. Stop. Remember, we're talking about bitterness. Offense. It's impossible, but that offenses will come. And then he begins to talk about offense for a few verses. For the sake of time, I'm skipping to six. So this is the context. And the Lord said, if he had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this what? What does it say? You might say unto this sycamine tree. It specifically says sycamine tree. Now, listen. 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 You might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it shall what? Think about it. Consider it. Put it on its list of options. Yeah, we'll see. It shall obey you. It shall obey you. Amen. He was referring to this this tree that he's talking about. He's referring to unforgiveness and bitterness. Unforgiveness and bitterness. Why did he choose the sycamine tree? You ever wonder, if you just glaze through this like we can do sometimes, anybody read your Bible and you think, I don't know what that means, but let's continue. (laughs) Okay, praise God for it. I don't know how to say that or what that means, but here we go. Let's continue on. Leviticus chapter 2. Okay. Right? And you, go, you read stuff and you're thinking, okay, that's, that was nice. Got that part in, but no clue. Why did Je- Do you think that Jesus just speaks for no reason? Absolutely just throwing out, you know, if you just do, say into the cedar bush, uh, he, he's not throwing out random bushes, random botany stuff. This is specific for a reason. If you'll say into the sycamine tree, let's look at the sycamine tree for a minute. Okay, the sycamine tree is a well-known tree in the Middle East. Very well-known, widely used, widely available. Now, I'm going to really look at my notes here, not because I can't preach without notes, but because there's a lot of details in here. I want to get them to you in a hurry. So if you, I'd like you to take notes if you've got something to take notes with. Otherwise, get the, um, the stream later. Some in- interesting information about the sycamine tree. Number one, has a very large root system, gigantic size root system. The tree went up to 30 feet, but the roots went so deep that it was difficult to kill. There was enough life in the roots that even if you went to chop the thing down, it would continue to suck life all the way down from the bottom and pull it up so that it would always continue to to grow back. Even if you try to chop it, it would regrain strength. Didn't matter. Just keep chopping it, keep chopping it. It continues to be strong. It continues to grow. Now, if we're thinking about the the context Jesus is speaking about is bitterness and unforgiveness, then we have to start making these characteristics of the sycamine tree and compare them to bitterness and unforgiveness. If you're not careful... You can continue to stew on that thing that person did to you over and over and over and over. And you might come to the altar and chop it down once. I'm okay, Lord. I'm okay. But if you don't do what it takes to rip the roots out, while it's small, 
I mean, if you, if you, you you've all seen a mature oak tree. I mean, it's just it's massive. And I've heard people say that uh, usually a tree, its roots are as big. If you look at the branches, it's as big underneath the ground as it is up top. So think about trying to get and hug this tree at the bottom and yank that thing out. What tractor, you know, what kind of equipment would you use to pull out an oak tree? Okay, I'm switching to the oak tree just as a, a visual that you all have seen before. It's a humongous tree. It's not just going to get yanked out. It would be better that once an offense comes to deal with it while it's sprouting rather than let it fester and grow and get deeper and deeper and deeper into your life until it's so far down that it seems like no matter what you try to do, no matter how many times you try to cut, bring it to the Lord and cut it off, it continues to find life and grow again. Amen. Verse or part two. I'm a preacher, so everything's a verse. Uh, Part two here. Sycamine wood was the preferred wood for caskets. You can look all this up. And for coffins, you know, same thing, in Egypt and the Middle East. That that was the preferred wood, always. They loved to use that wood. Why? Because it grew very fast. So they'd plant more and it'd just grow really quick. It grew up in a variety of environments, so if it's dry, it didn't matter. In fact, the truth is, is it would grow faster and better in a very dry environment where it had no kind of hydration whatsoever. I mean, it would thrive in that kind of environment. Think about bitterness. You know, the more joy you have, the harder it is to be bitter. So the further you stay out of church, the less you read the word, the less you pray, the less joy you have in your life, you're getting spiritually dry. And you're, you're creating the very atmosphere it takes for bitterness and unforgiveness to thrive and grow and multiply like you wouldn't believe. Amen. So we've got to be very careful to make sure that we're, in the, we're creating the environment within ourselves, that bitterness and unforgiveness cannot thrive in. If you're going to create a pond in your yard and you're wanting to stock it with fish, it would be smart to figure out how to design the thing and the right elements it needs and the, making sure all the, the, the levels in the water are correct What for what? To create the correct environment for these fish to live in. Amen. So if we're going to live for Jesus... And avoid some of this mess. We're going to have to create the right environment for the Lord to work in. Create the right environment that keeps some of this other junk out. Amen. 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 I got one amen. Amen. It's truth. Amen. Amen. Hatred, bitterness, and unforgiveness are deadly. That's the other connection that we can make from this. Jesus isn't picking the sycamine tree randomly. It's the preferred wood for caskets. Guess what? Studies have shown that people who have been bitter and angry and ticked off oftentimes will die early because of health problems. Because it affects not just your mind, but it begins to take its toll on your body. Amen. We've got to be careful. You know, I've had some people do me, do me wrong. In fact, even recently do me bad wrong. They've lied about me. They lied about my, you know, what I believe, what I teach. They've they've uh, done their best to spread lies about my family and about my fathers in the faith. Well, I have every right to be ticked. You know what I mean? Sure. If I told you everything, some of you'd be fighting it. You'd be mad. You'd be getting together a posse. You know, let's go get them. Sure. But I can't live that way. My ministry will be stifled for the rest of my life if I stew on everything anyone ever did wrong to me, every stupid thing someone said to me, every lie someone told about me. Amen. That's, that's part of life. And honestly, that's part of Christianity. You're going to have people say stuff, do stuff. You're going to have family members that are just gomer piles. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Gomer piles, huh? Yeah, they're just, huh? They don't get it. 
And you got to just let it go. Let it go. Don't, don't let it take root and fester and grow on the inside of you. Amen? Don't allow these things to pull you away from God and create an environment that it can continue to grow and thrive even better. Amen. You ready for another point? The sycamine tree produced a fig that was bitter to eat. Now, oftentimes it's compared to a mulberry tree. Some of your versions may even have the word mulberry instead of sycamine. But if you study it out, remember the Bible says study to show yourself approved? If you study it out, they're, they're two different trees. The mulberry tree was, looked almost identical to a sycamine tree, and it also bare fruit, like fig-type fruit. But the mulberry tree was actually delicious. It was sweet, and it was very expensive. The sycamine tree looked identical. It had figs, and it was very cheap because it grew everywhere. No effort whatsoever. But the fruit tasted extremely, extremely bitter. <clears throat> In fact, the poor people would typically get themselves sycamine fruit, figs, and they'd suck on it. And it's, it was so bitter that you know, they wanted to have something like all the rich people that could afford the mulberry figs. So they would, it would be so bitter, it would, they'd suck on it and they'd have to just wait a little bit, just keep sucking on it. And then they'd go back. You couldn't just bite into it like a mulberry and just hammer it down. Delicious and all that. Now they'd suck on it. You know, anybody remember warheads? Yes. Those candies? Good Lord, those things are demonic. <laughs> Whew. Not really, but you know what I mean. They, they, they're, they'll kick your tongue around. Yeah, you got you, you to gotta suck on it a little bit and pull away, take a break, and then go back after it. Take a break, go back after it. Bitterness is very similar because a lot of times we're not just sitting there 24 hours a day. Oh, I can't believe they did that. <laughs> Usually we suck on it for a little bit, think about it, meditate on it, and then we take a break, move on to life. And then we go back to it, think about it some more, tell the story a few hundred more times, and then we take a break. And then what do we do? We go back to it. It's so bitter that, you, you know, it's one of those things where you want to go back to it because it somehow makes you feel better. And yet at the same time, you're letting the root system grow. You're building your, co your coffin. And it's so bitter that it's actually, when you get around, anybody ever got, been around people that are bitter? And it leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. It's like, man, I, I don't know. I just, it's not like some, those aren't the people I want to hang with. Every time I'm with them, they got some horrible thing, some bad story. Some, ugh, 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 ugh. Amen. I don't want that to be me. And it shouldn't be you. Amen. So, uh, you know, the holidays are coming, of course. I just said that. And my, my thought with this isn't specific to holidays because this applies all the time. But it kind of gets highlighted during the holidays because we kind of... Most people tend to surround themselves with more people than they usually do. Sometimes surround themselves with more people than they want to. <laughs> right? But we've got to be very careful that we're not fostering and creating an environment for bitterness to grow in. Amen. One last note. We're going to move along here. I'll let you back to your evening here. The fourth element to the sycamine tree that you might want to write down is that the only way it's pollinated is by wasps. It has to be stung in order to pollinate. When I first heard, heard this, I, I thought, that can't be true. What? I looked it up. Sure as the world. Could, I mean, it's just an incredible thing. It's not naturally pollinated. It literally has to have a wasp stick its stinger in and carry it somewhere else to pollinate. Amen. It's nuts. The process was initiated when the wasp would stick its stinger into its fruit. It goes right into the fruit. The tree and its fruit had been stung in order to reproduce. 
It's an amazing thing that bitterness and unforgiveness requires people to be stung. It's got to go right into the heart. You know, for most of us in here were mature enough, if I said, hey, you're ugly and your mom dresses you funny. Okay, see ya. You know, who cares? It's like, well, oh, sure. But, but you know, it, it's one of those things where it really cuts you deep. That's, that's, when you're, that's when the wasp got into your heart, where it stings deep, where they attacked what you believe. I'm, I'm talking about they got you in, made you feel like you're at home, got you in a vulnerable situation, and then uh, nailed you, and it hit you right in the heart. Sometimes you, family can be the ones that hurt you the most. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or your best friends, and anybody been betrayed before? Sure. You know, I, do you ever consider it a, a betrayal by an acquaintance? Somebody you barely know? Is that, can you be betrayed by someone you barely know? I mean, they could do you wrong, but betrayal is usually when you've let somebody in. They're close. And now all of a sudden, they're behind your back. They're hugging you with one part, but they've got a knife in their hand. You know what I'm talking about? So we've got to be very careful. The, bitterness and unforgiveness can ruin your life if you allow it to run rampant. If you don't do anything about it. While it's small, while it's fresh, while a cut has just been done. Let the Lord heal that situation right away. Deal with it then. Don't allow the roots to continue to grow. Don't allow it to get so deep that now it takes this colossal thing, huge work, you know, party to get out and dig this thing out and look for every single root to get the thing out. Don't allow it to affect you so much and so long that it begins to affect your health and drive you to your early grave. Amen. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't allow one sting for you to go and transfer it and let it pollinate into other people's hearts. Sometimes you have to be careful telling stories because, you know, you might affect the person you're telling. So you you either leave names out or leave locations out or find a way to get the principle across. And here's what happened. But you don't want someone carrying a grudge for you. Because some people have friends that loyal. Amen. Some people get offended because someone of the opposite sex did or said something to them. And now that opposite sex is the devil for the rest of their life. Right? Men are always like that. I'll tell you, men. uh... You know what I'm talking about? You got burned once and all of a sudden, from then on. Or someone of a different race. Different skin color. And now all of a sudden, anybody that looks anything like that, they're the devil. He's going to be just like that person. You cannot do that. Because offense and bitterness will begin to grow into full-on hatred. Full-on hatred. And you have to decide, am I the environment that hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness likes to dwell in? Hate is like a chameleon. Takes on the color of whoever allows it to rest upon them. So it doesn't matter whether you're black, white, brown, purple. Hate can be anywhere. You just have to decide whether you're going to let it in you. Bitterness, unforgiveness. That family member that messed you up recently or long ago, what are you going to do with it? Believe me, we all have a reason. We've all got something. We've all got a reason. But the Lord told me to deal with this, and for me it felt like it was out of left field. But somebody needed to hear this. Don't allow whatever that is to go with you into your future. Cut it off now. You know, my dad has said it this way, and maybe... Maybe you have here before too, but think about the word offended. If you're believing God for something, the moment you become offended, your faith is off and it's ended. You heard that before? Yeah. That's what offense does. So you're building your faith, you're believing God for something, and it could be vital. It could be life and death. And all of a sudden you let something, some offense to get in there. Now you're offended. Well, now you've... You've cut your faith. Your faith is now off. Your faith is now ended. 
because you've chosen to give residence instead of to faith, to bitterness, to unforgiveness. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Go ahead and stand with me, would you, would you please? And then I'll turn the service over. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time together. We worship you today. And we thank you for giving us authority over these things. You said in your word that if you will say to the sycamine tree, say to the sycamine tree, we're not going to put up with this stuff anymore in our life. We're going to speak to our mind, speak to our bodies, speak to our finances, and speak to any kind of bitterness and unforgiveness that tries to step foot inside of our hearts, and we will speak and say to it, you have got to go. What the Lord has placed in my heart is too valuable for you, offense, to mess it up. So right now, right where you're at, if you're harboring any kind of bitterness, you, I mean, you may feel like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure. If there's even a question, you get rid of it now. Just right where you're at, right with the Lord. You want to leave here clean. Now, you might have everything else ready in good, clean, proper order. But this bitterness and unforgiveness thing creeps into all kinds of corners of your house. Don't let it happen. Ask the Lord to forgive you right now. Just say, I release them, whoever it is. I release it and I let them go. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for freedom. Freedom from fear. Freedom from bitterness. Freedom from unforgiveness. Freedom from strife. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God.